thank you so much, Ger, and the team. And it's very embarrassing to have that sort of introduction. So we'll just leave that to one side, but thank you. I do feel so at home here with you all worshipping Jesus here at Vintage Church. So what a joy to be together. So this morning, I want to begin by asking you a question. How did God first come onto the horizon of your life? I wasn't born into a Christian family. In fact, my grandparents um, escaped Soviet occupation after the Second World War in Europe and arrived in Britain in 1948 with my dad and his sister. They landed at RAF North Holt, a tiny little military um, air airport about 20 minutes from where I live now, just in the clothes they were standing up in that they'd escaped in. My grandfather was a brilliant scientist and a very committed atheist, so much so that he forbade anyone from using the word God in the house and a Bible was not allowed to cross the threshold of the house. My father went on to become an academic himself as well and met my mum and he taught at different universities around the world, including out here in the States and then settled in Australia where he had a post at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. And he had a really great life by that point. He was in his 30s, lovely house, intellectually fulfilling career, enough money to live on, two quite frankly fantastic children, <laughs> lived near the beach, you know, had the lifestyle some of you guys have. And he was really happy, apart from there was one question that sometimes occurred to him that when he thought about it, he felt worried. And the question was, when I get to 65 and I retire, and I look back on my life, will this be enough? That frightened him, even though he had, you know, what he thought he, he, he had wanted in life. One day, a colleague at the university invited him to come to a lunchtime lecture. And my dad, not really knowing what it was about, but a curious person went along. And the guy giving the talk was actually making a presentation about um, the Christian faith and some of the evidences for the Christian faith. And my father just thought lots of things, but the main thing he thought was, wow, I've never heard anything like this. This guy is making a fundamental category mistake. He's putting two things together that don't belong together. He's putting faith in God and religion, which is all about wish fulfillment, family heritage, culture or superstition, he's putting that together with evidence, truth and reality and those things don't belong together. So he left that, um, that meeting with one line that the Christian had said and the line was this, the only reason you should be a Christian is because it's true. So my dad was getting on with his life. Um, he was marking some exam papers one day at home and my sister and I were asleep. My mother was asleep in the house. And he had an extraordinary open vision of Jesus and his life flashed before him. And he saw over a couple of hours decisions that he'd made, um, scenarios in his life replayed. And at the end, he saw Christ on the cross and he understood that he was being offered forgiveness and new life. And he thought, uh, uh, he was overwhelmed and he knelt down just in his study and he thought, I need to pray, but I, I don't have any words. I don't know how to pray. No one's ever taught me to pray. So he said to Jesus, give me the words. And so these are the words that Jesus gave him that he said. He said, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. A few weeks later, after he'd gone and bought a Bible in a shop down the road, and he read those words in Mark's gospel, he was quite surprised. <laughs> so that evening, he went and woke my mum up and said, Jane, the most amazing thing's happened. I've become a Christian. And my mum was less than encouraged by this. <laughs> And my father um, thought, well, a few, a few weeks later, he thought, I, I would like to meet other people who know Jesus, because the person who'd taken him to the event was teaching, um, doing a sabbatical abroad. So he thought for quite a long time before he settled on the idea, maybe at church there might be other people. Maybe I should try going to church. So he said to my mum, I'm too embarrassed to go on my own. Will you come with me? 
And she thought to herself, well, I know my husband is intelligent. I know how I can cure him of Christianity. So she said, sure, I'll come to church as long as it's Anglican, thinking once he's experienced that, he'll be cured for life. <laughs> he'll be absolutely fine. So they arrived at a church in Sydney, which was a Bible-believing church. And um, anyway, it's a long story. Six months of an intellectual struggle, and my mother became a Christian. So I grew up in a family, yeah, praise God, grew up in a context where my parents had radically encountered the person of Jesus and had come to believe and be utterly convicted that God is real and gave their whole lives to him. That's how God came onto the horizon of my life. How did he come onto the horizon of yours? Today we're going to be thinking about um, Mary, and in particular, if you've got a Bible, you may want to open it at Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. But this, this person, Mary, we first encounter in the Gospel narratives as a young, unmarried teenager. And um, I just want to stop for a moment and ask you to consider, up to this point, what your what in your mind's eye you imagine just when you hear the word Mary, when you think of Mary. Because still culturally, I think visions and images of Mary hang around from pre-Renaissance art, you know, the woman in the blue dress, uh, slightly sort of beatific smile on her face, maybe hovering, but not, not really in the gritty reality of our world. Sometimes with a big fat sort of cherubic baby on her, on her hip, but, but kind of stuck perpetually in probably a four-week season of her life as a new mother. I once um, played Mary in a school play. I don't know if you do this here in America, but in Britain, you know, even in the state schools, we do reenactments of the nativity at Christmas time. And I once played Mary, and for the entire hour-long production, I didn't utter a word. <laughs> Mary is to us, and in our culture, Mary is a mute figure, silenced. Now, I can remember exactly where I was when I first listened to Mary's voice in the scriptures. I've been through um, a very traumatic time in my own life and ministry, and through that, having been very focused on theology and apologetics and teaching at Oxford and traveling around and doing lots of kind of public theology, through that experience also began to work in advocacy for people who have experienced sexual abuse, including in religious contexts. And I was supporting a, a woman. This is a slight trigger warning. We won't go into massive detail, don't worry, but I just want to, to put that out there. I was supporting a woman who had been abused as a child and had gone to the police as an adult to, to say what had happened because the perpetrator was still alive, a powerful man in British society. And unusually, for someone who's gone through that, um, the police felt there was enough to bring charges and a criminal trial was happening. It was happening in a big city in Britain. So I committed to go and be there for the trial and just be in the public gallery and to pray, but to be a support to those giving evidence. On the second day of the trial, you've heard the absolute horror retold. You've seen people who have suffered the unimaginable interrogated by the barrister for the accused. And um, we, we just, I was feeling desperate and asking, God, where are you? Will you come? Will you help? Will you deliver? Will you save? Might there be justice? And I, I wanted to go and pray some more. So um, I went to the cathedral, and it happened to be in a city where there's one of the most sort of historic and beautiful cathedrals. And I just sort of stumbled into the cathedral, wanting to be in the presence of God, but to bring the agony of that trial before him. And um, as I was sitting there, I was given the service sheet, wasn't particularly there, even song was about to happen, wasn't particularly there for that, but had the sheet. 
The service sort of began, and at one point, the choir got up to sing beautiful choral music, transcendent music. And I just looked down at the sheet at the, at the very moment the choir sang the words, and they were singing Mary's Magnificat, and they sang the words, He hath brought the rulers down from their thrones, and he will exalt them of low degree. It hit me between the eyes. Mary's vision of who the Messiah is, of who Jesus is, and what he's coming into this world to do, articulated in her Magnificat, was so powerful in that moment. It's so powerful in our dark world. That's the first time I realized Mary had a voice and I hadn't listened to it. So today, together, we're going to be thinking about um, what we can learn from Mary, the mother of Jesus, and in particular, what it really meant that she was anointed, what we can draw from that into our own Christian lives as we follow Jesus. But let me begin by just reading the words of the Magnificat from Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, from verse 46. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm and he has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down the rulers from their thrones but has lifted up the humble. He's filled the hungry with good things but has sent the rich away empty. He's helped his servant Israel remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever just as he promised our ancestors. Just a quick note on the tenses used there. Often in biblical prophecy, and you'll see this in, in Isaiah as well, the tense is used as something in the past tense that has happened, but it's a prophetic word being given of a future reality, future kingdom breaking into our here and now. So let's begin. What does it mean to be anointed? And what did that mean for Mary? Well, firstly, in the life of Mary, we see that anointing, and the fulfillment of scripture, the fulfillment of prophecy go together. Mary was a Jewish woman who knew the scriptures. Now, we know that she had some knowledge of the scriptures because she quotes from the Bible in her, in, in her Magnificat. And she may have known, she may have been aware of the prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 7 and verse 14 where the prophet writes, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and he will call him Emmanuel. So prophesied a few hundred years before Mary is alive, God is saying that in the history of his people, there will come a moment when a woman, a young woman has a child born in reality and history who will be, be called Emmanuel, God with us. So a woman will have a baby called God with us. She may have known that. Mary would certainly, though, have known the words recorded in the book of Genesis, because all, all um, Jewish young people would have known the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The first messianic promise of the Bible, given in the context of the fall, the context of sin and suffering and death entering this world, and in that context, God has a conversation with Adam and Eve and speaks to the serpent as well, representing evil. And he says of the woman, your seed will bruise the serpent's head. The first messianic promise that someone will come into this world through a woman, a woman's seed, that will have the power to utterly crush and defeat evil in this world. Mary, the daughter of Eve, is the fulfiller of that first messianic promise of the Bible. Now, you know, here in the West, um, often when we get married, like I took my, I blame my husband for my unpronounceable surname, <laughs> too many vowels. Um, 
so I took his name, and we have three sons, and they have their father's name. That's, that's traditional, isn't it? And obviously not everybody does that, but that's kind of standard and common still even today. In the Old Testament era, imagine the context of the ancient Near East. Certainly, a, ma- a family line was passed through the mail. So to have here this promise that something extraordinary is going to happen and it will be a woman's seed, not a biological male involved. There will be a woman's seed through whom and through which the power of evil will be totally crushed. This is prophetic. What Mary experiences in Luke's gospel, chapter one, this angel appearing to her and telling her she's going to have a baby is the fulfillment of prophecy. Think about it this way. This speaks profoundly of who our God is and who he calls. If an ordinary, poor, young, oppressed woman could play any kind of role in anything, culturally that would have been amazing. But to be the one through whom the redemption of the world would come is astonishing. And it's even more astonishing in the cultural context of the Bible. And by positioning Mary in this way, the New Testament makes itself unlike any document of the era. The world is being turned upside down. The categories and priorities of the world are being turned upside down. So if you're here this morning wondering, little old me, I couldn't possibly have any significance to the creator of the universe, or my life doesn't really have any value or worth. As you read the scriptures, as you read the Bible, that is not God's verdict on you. If God could use and choose a person like Mary. Secondly, Mary understood and lived in reality and was prepared to pay a cost. You know, I meet lots of people who um, don't have faith. I'm often giving talks and lectures in contexts where people don't believe in the Christian faith and they're answering questions. And often people's perception of religious people is that religious people sort of live with their head in the clouds on this very esoteric level of floating around in spiritual realities. And quite frankly, we've all got Christian friends a bit like that, haven't we? Let's be honest. They're they're up there in the heavenlies. We're having wonderful visions with, with Jesus and they make us feel slightly inadequate when they share them. Now, what we see in Mary is not a model like that. Mary lives in reality. Mary's a woman living at a moment in history where she's living in the very insignificant district of a country. That country is under occupation by the world's most powerful empire, the Roman Empire. Now, slight pause here. It's hard to imagine what it's like to live like un- to live under occupation. In Europe, um, after the war broke out in, in Ukraine, in Britain, and in lots of European countries, churches and other people um, offered to welcome and lobbied to have receive refugees coming from Ukraine and said, we will have them in our homes. So my husband and I had the privilege of welcoming two Ukrainian women about four or five weeks after the war had broken out. A lady in her 80s and her daughter in her 60s. They'd experienced um, the Russian army come and devastate where they lived, including their livelihood. They had a small holding. And um, they, they were able to bring one bag and the clothes they were standing up in, pay people, traffickers, to get to the Polish border. And then from there, they got a Red Cross flight to Britain. So we, we got to know these ladies and to hear the stories of what it means to be a woman living under occupation. And I can tell you, it's horrific. That's Mary's context. Now think about living as a woman when a woman's voice meant nothing in the Greco-Roman world. A woman's witness 
wasn't, didn't have any validity in a court of law. And if you read the rabbinic literature of the first century, you'll see that it was extremely patriarchal and negative about women. So that's Mary's context. She's living under occupation. She's living in rel relative poverty. And she's a woman at a time where it's very hard to be a woman. And she's young. The angel Gabriel comes to her and says, Mary, you're highly favoured. I wonder if she felt highly favoured. Stop and think for a minute. What does that mean for us? Have you and I equated the favour and blessing of God with the American dream? Have you and I fallen into patterns of believing that unless this particular success that I want or this particular standard that I desire, or this particular prayer about a stage of life that I must be in, unless that is fulfilled, I'm not experiencing the blessing of God. The New Testament, the New Testament positions Mary as a person experiencing suffering by every measure that you could use, as a person experiencing oppression. If you look at the power discourses of our age right now, you know, if you think about intersectionality thinking, Mary comes out as someone who's really oppressed, yet God calls her favoured. People of God, do we live under the verdict of what this world says about us? Or are we living in the truth of the scriptures that the favour and love and blessing of God are experienced in this world where people suffer, including us, Christians? So, oh, not the water over, sorry. Got a bit excited about that one. So Mary has been told she's favoured, okay? Then the angel has even more news for her. Not only are you living in this district, you're occupied, you're female, now you're pregnant. And you're unmarried. Think about what that would have meant in her context. The text says that Mary was worried when she heard these words. <laughs> she was troubled and she was afraid. Again, the Gospels are so outstanding in how they record the work of God in reality. This is a great reaction that rings true, right? This isn't the person with their head in the clouds of, great, a virgin conception. Yeah, of course, we're in the Bible now, right? No, she was worried and she was troubled and she asked the question, how can this be since I am a virgin? In other words, she understood biology. How can this be? I want to encourage you, if you've got questions, if you've got concerns in your faith, bring them to God. Don't suppress them. The very worst things people could say about God Think about the things the new atheism says about God. People in the Bible say those things about God. I don't believe in you. You don't exist. Where the hell are you? Why do the wicked prosper and you seem to do nothing? The Christian faith is a safe place for people who have questions. Mary questions. She lives in the real world of reality. And then we see that she's prepared to pay a cost. You see, having heard back from the angel um, that her son will be the son of the Most High, he will reign on David's throne, his kingdom will be everlasting, it will have no end. She then says, may it be to me as your servant has said, I'm the Lord's servant, may your word to me be fulfilled. What outstanding faith. Not faith that is totally unrealistic about the cost. Faith located in the real world. Thirdly, we see that Mary used her voice. She exercises her vocal cords. She's a witness. A very seemingly insignificant phrase in the gospel, verse, verse 46 of Luke chapter 1. And Mary said... 
Now, Luke, at the beginning of his gospel, is, is careful to sort of explain his methodology. Because Luke was a Gentile. He hadn't himself been one of Jesus' disciples observing all the things that are written in the gospel that happened in the life of Jesus. But his methodology was to go and talk to and interrogate the eyewitnesses and then write his gospel on the basis of that robust evidence. Right, so he's told us in chapter one, right at the beginning of the gospel, that that's how he went about writing it. Now, we know from, um, from various sources that Mary was one of the primary eyewitness sources for Luke's gospel. So in his gospel, her perceptions, her observations, her eyewitness testimony is included. But stunningly in chapter 1, verse 46, we don't just have that, we also have her words. Again, this makes the New Testament unlike any document of the era. Even if you weren't a Christian, this would be amazing. To have the recorded speech of a first century woman and a woman who is poor and oppressed and living under occupation is utterly stunning. It speaks of the values of the one who wrote this word. It speaks of the values of the Holy Spirit who inspired this word. So, and Mary said is quite an important phrase. And out of her flows the reading that we heard, the Magnificat, this kind of de defiant declaration of praise and this description of who God is and, and the meaning of Jesus' coming. The Magnificat is also seen as extraordinarily important Christian ethical teaching. It's the foundation alongside the Sermon on the Mount of Christian ethics. And so we have Mary's anointing evidenced in her witness, both her verbal witness through Luke's gospel, but also through the Magnificat. Mary uses her voice to witness. Do you? Do I? One of the evidences of the Holy Spirit's work is that our vocal cords are engaged in both praise to God, but also witness of Jesus. A little while ago, I was speaking in a church in Asia, and this church is um, led by business people. They don't have any paid staff, and it meets in a hotel. And um, they'd asked me to come and uh, bring a kind of gospel message, and they were all going to bring friends and colleagues to hear the message. And so I'd prepared that, and it's about two minutes to 10, and we're sitting on the front row, and the, the leader comes to me and says, Amy, listen, we might have a visiting dignitary coming to church today. If he comes, don't change your message. So I sort of said, well, who is it? Why, why would I change my message? And he said, well, don't worry about who it is. Just don't change your message. I said, well, I am worried now. <laughs> so please just tell me. So he said, well, um, it's this gentleman who, and he named him and said he's the um, grand imam of the world's fifth largest mosque. And um, in, in a country, obviously in a Muslim country, and he might be coming to church this morning. So sure enough, in the first song, in he came with his entourage. It was obvious who it was. And I had the privilege of preaching the gospel. And afterwards, I met him and I said, sir, can I ask you, why are you here? What brought you to, to this church in this hotel this Sunday? This is what he said. A few months ago, my wife was diagnosed with terminal cancer. He said, the Christians in our city heard about this. And knowing he knew what they suffered, they made contact and said, can we come and pray for her in Jesus' name? So he said, we were so desperate that we accepted. And they came and laid hands and prayed for her and she was completely healed. And we know it was Jesus, he said. <laughs> Praise God. So he said, a few, he said, I didn't really know what to make of that. Um, for various reasons. Then he said, I was on a flight. And then the guy who'd brought him to church came. And this is a gentleman, a member of that congregation, a businessman who traveled a lot for work. 
And as part of his devotion to Jesus, he'd committed that any time I get on a plane, whoever I sit next to, I'm going to try and share something of the love of Jesus with the person in the seat next to me. So he said, when I got on the plane and I looked who was in the next seat, I thought, this isn't looking hopeful. (laughs) But he began to share in very simple personal terms something of his own experience of Jesus with the grand imam of a country. And that man then told him what had happened and said, I've been questioning. So this guy says to him, next time you go to any conference or speak anywhere, I want you, I'm going to pay your flight. You route it through my country. You come on Sunday morning. You come to church. You hear the word of God preached. You meet other Christians. You get prayed for. And he said, that's why I'm here. Through the witness of suffering Christians and a businessman who talks to people on planes. Mary was a witness. Are you? Am I? And then very briefly and finally, Mary read the power discourses of the world and she believed defiantly that Jesus Christ is the hope of humanity. Mary read the power dynamics. If you read the Magnificat, through the lens of power and people in our age in academic departments around the world and social commentators are obsessed with power. Who's got the power? Who's oppressing who? And if you read the Magnificat in our world right now, it is so relevant. He will bring those who abuse power. He'll bring the rulers down from their thrones. He will raise up the hungry and fill them with good things. She knew what it was to suffer power abuse. And she defiantly hoped in Jesus. For any of us who've been on the receiving end of power abuse, we will recognise the courage of Mary's Magnificat. And we'll recognise the hope in our hearts beginning to rise. Perhaps some of us experience power misused in the family we grew up in the domestic bully, the tyrant who must be obeyed. Perhaps some of us have experienced violence in romantic relationships or in our workplaces where we've known the oppression of a boss who's just utterly toxic and it feels like destroying our lives. Perhaps some of us have been part of communities that imploded And we've been just on the wrong end of power. We've known what it is to be abused, to be taken advantage of, to be betrayed, to be crushed, or to be trampled underfoot by ego and domination. Anyone in this church who knows even the tiniest taste of that might feel the thrill that Mary's heart felt at the coming of Jesus. He will bring the rulers down from their thrones and exalt them of low degree. As a Christian, you and I live in a world where there is domination and darkness and power abuse, but we live with the hope of the one who is mighty and powerful to save and who is returning one day soon. And who will set all things right? We live with the hope of a good and godly judgment to come. Mary points us to a God who can be trusted with power in a world where power harms and hurts so many of us. So that's what anointing looks like. The fulfillment of prophecy and the fulfillment of scripture being in reality and being prepared to pay a cost, using our voices, unlocking those vocal cords and understanding and reading the power discourses of our day and defying them with the hope of Jesus. Amen.